My mentor uh, and friend, Paulo Freire, with whom I wrote uh, the book uh, Pedagogy for Liberation, uh, was born in Brazil in 1921 and uh, grew up in very uh, poor circumstances and uh, fell asleep in school often as a boy because he was too hungry to pay attention. So as a boy, when he was 11, he said he made a vow that he was going to devote his life to make sure that no children go hungry. So as he grew up, he eventually uh, was, uh, went on to um, the uh, university. And uh, in 1942, when he was um, uh, 21 years old, he, he got admitted to law school and decided he would become a lawyer. So he went to law school and got his law degree. And his first job out of law school, he was asked to take uh, the case of a, uh, of a creditor against a dentist. Now, this dentist had opened a new practice and outfitted his uh, office and so on with all the equipment. And nobody came and his uh, clientele was uh, far too few to pay off his debt. So Paulo had to go and sue him and uh, demand uh, the payment for all uh, the unpaid uh, charges. So he interviewed the dentist and the dentist was uh, very humble and said to Paulo, said, uh, uh, sorry, you can have everything. You can have all my equipment. You can have the drills and the, and the uh, lights, and you can have all the furniture in my house. You can have our dishware and silverware. You can have the drapes. The only thing you cannot have is our beautiful baby daughter, who we love, but everything else you can take away with you. This speech so affected Paolo and uh, made him so sad that he said to the dentist in response, uh, Sir, um, I'm going to wait a few days before I file uh, this uh, paper in court. In these three days, why don't you try to sell everything that you own and see how much money you can get for it? And then when later on, we'll take whatever is left that you couldn't sell. Then after saying that to, to the, the dentist, he came home and told his first wife, Elsa, that he was not going to be a lawyer, that he was quitting law practice that day after going through law school and the university and so on. And Paolo uh, decided to, to be unemployed and wait to see what would come next. His wife, his first wife, Elsa, was very pleased because she thought that he should not be a lawyer but had some other vocation in store for him. Eventually, Paolo got a job at a, a new um, uh, government agency called Industrial so Social Services where he was in charge of family education. He had to set up an education program for uh, working class families in the urban areas and uh, that would uh, teach them how to raise their children and so on and so on. And this was to civilize the working class and make them uh, suitable uh, employees for the developing industries of, uh, of Brazil. And so Paulo Ferri took the job and when he came there, he, uh, he brought families together for a meeting in the community and he stood up and he started lecturing them about uh, Piaget and other scholars of uh, childhood and talking to them about child development and what kind of punishment makes sense because the parents tended to hit their children and this and that. And he went on, you know, for a considerable amount of time. At the end of the time, Paolo tells the story that a, a working class a man in the audience raises his hand and stands up and he says out loud to Paolo in the group, he says, Professor, what you said shows you are a very, very smart and educated man. And that, that is important to me. But I want to I wanna tell you, I want to ask you a question, the working man said to him. He said, uh, sir, uh, is it true that you live in a big house and that uh, all your children have their own bedrooms? So Paulo Freire looked and said, yes, yes. And sir, um, you have uh, like a, a bathroom in the house that you can close the door and wash yourself in. And Paulo Freire said, yes. Well, he said, sir, professor, what I want you to do is understand how I live. Me and my five children, we live in a one room shack. And every night I have to make love to my wife in front of my children. And uh, that was the statement he made. And that sort of like ended the meeting. And Paulo was very embarrassed and had nothing more to say. What Paulo Ferry took away from that was that his job was not to lecture the parents about all these uh, academic education that he had,
but rather he had to now go study the, the working class families and the peasant families in his area and learn the everyday conditions of their life and become familiar with the ways they eat, they live, the way that they work and what kind of um, food and transportation they have. And until he knew the everyday culture of their life, he was not fit to be their teacher. In this way, he established a precedent that the teacher must overcome the student-teacher contradiction by becoming a, stu a, a student of the students and learn about them before the teacher pre presumed to teach them about what the teacher, what the teacher knew. So Balafari went on and then he became uh, head of this uh, division and he took this uh, principle of uh, power from the bottom up, knowledge making from the bottom up, that democracy and equality was a practice that we had to, in that we had to install everywhere we went in every side situation, workplace. And uh, for example, the, an issue came up where the directors of this uh, organization said they wanted to uh, re, um, remodel the, the uniforms of, uh, of the janitors. And now they were insisting that all the janitors had to wear special hats uh, to look proper. So Paulo Freire said that it's, it's not right that he says when you ask anyone to wear a hat, it changes their whole appearance and, and their wardrobe and so on. He said, we should first ask the janitors, do they want to change their uniform? And that the decision about the uniform should be made by the people who are going to be affected by the decision. So this was the idea that policy making is not directed from the top down, but policy making is a dialogue from the bottom up where the people who are affected by all these decisions decide themselves what they think is uh, appropriate for them. This is a principle of, of democracy and equality that should be brought to the everyday circumstances, including the circumstances of the classrooms where we uh, teachers practice uh, educa education. And Paulo Freire uh, then went on uh, from there to uh, write uh, you know, the books about his, um, his work, and he, uh, he got a, a PhD from the University of, um, of uh, Recife in studying uh, uh, the literacy of uh, uh, Brazil, and eventually uh, joined a variety of uh, opposition groups in society, in Brazilian society, that were attempting to, um, to democratize, because at that time, uh, all illiterates to, to be able to vote in Brazil, you had to be able to read and write. And at that time, uh, the great mass of peasants and workers uh, did not have enough uh, schooling or literacy to qualify to vote. So all governments were elected by the elite without the, uh, the working class and the peasants having any, any voting rights. So there was a lot of agitation to uh, rewrite the Constitution so that all Brazilians were declared citizens who had the right to vote regardless of their of their uh, literacy. Uh, these movements gained uh, a lot of um, momentum in the 50s and the early 60s and developed what uh, the American ambassador at that time in Brazil thought was the pre-revolutionary situation. And so it was uh, decided that the only way to stop uh, Brazil from uh, going, uh, having this uh, revolution was uh, a military coup, which happened in um, April of 1964. Paulo Freire was in the countryside at that time, and uh, he um, was uh, doing teacher, teacher development for a literacy program. He received a call that there's trouble in the capital. You must come back to your office right away. Now he came back to the office and discovered that a coup was, was underway. He had been brought to the capital by the president of Brazil who attended the first graduating class of uh, Paulo Freire's method, a very famous incident in Anguicos in northeastern Brazil, the impoverished section uh, in um, uh, April of 1963, about a year just before the coup. The president of Brazil brought all his, uh, his uh, cabinet there to witness how Paulo Freire taught illiterate peasants and workers to read and write in, uh, tr in uh, 40 hours of instruction. 
And uh, that class had 299 uh, people in it from the loc locale. Most of them were uh, domestic workers and so on. And at the end, they all showed they could read and write, and they made speeches to the president about the future of a democratic Brazil, which the president was so impressed. He said, Paulo, Paulo Ferro, you must come to Brasilia, and you must do this to the entire nation. And Paulo Ferro came, and he was about to establish 20,000 literacy circles so as uh, to um, transform illiterate Brazils into uh, voting, voting Brazilians when the military thought that uh, having a, an electorate uh, so um, filled with uh, folks in the bottom was too great a, uh, a threat to the oligarchy, and they overthrew, and Paulo Freire then had to go into hiding. He went into hiding, and no, the only South, a South American government that would allow him uh, um, a safety was in Bolivia. He went to Brazil, uh, Bolivia, he escaped, and then his family eventually joined him, and he went off to uh, he went off to uh, Chile. So uh, he, uh, thirty years after this famous class in Anguicos, where um, he taught uh, two hundred ninety nine illiterate peasants and workers to read in uh, forty hours of uh, of instruction by uh, draw, by asking them to read and write about the conditions of their everyday life. Uh, he went back to visit that place 30 years later after uh, the, um, the, the military government was uh, uh, replaced. And uh, so the, the former students who were still alive looked at him and one of them asked him, uh, Paulo, uh, why, why were you arrested? Why were you thrown in jail for 10 weeks? And why did you have to flee the country? And, and why did they come and destroy our literacy classes here in Angicos. And Paulo's answer was uh, very simple. He said, because I taught you too much. Because I taught you too much. That the peasants and workers were supposed to learn only the ABCs and the three R's. And they were not supposed to learn about democratization, about equality, or how to question the status quo. And because he, that was included in this pedagogy, Paulo Freire was declared a danger to the oligarchy and forced to flee, forced to flee the country. So he's, he always said this, that questioning the status quo is a choice, not an obligation. For all of us who understand that our future resides in questioning the status quo, which is making the planet uninhabitable and making everyday life so difficult for ordinary people. He said, for all of us who choose to question the status quo, we have to realize that this will not be a weekend on a tropical beach, that we have to expect difficulties, we have to expect uh, frustrations, and we have to expect some kind of uh, punishment. But in the middle of it all, we have to say, this is happening not because I made some terrible mistake or blunder, or I made the, uh, but rather because I made a choice I made a choice to stand up for a certain ethics, for a certain kind of world that inspires me, a dream of society that is less cruel, less unequal, and more democratic and more just. Making that choice is the future, the dream that we have of a world that we deserve and want to live in, and that was what has been so inspiring about Paulo Freire to me and so many others around the world.